with no loftier, more worthy ambition than the pursuit of an increasingly intimate, more biblically accurate knowledge of the God who created you. I would affirm that nothing has helped in my own personal life, nor my ministry orientation, than the study of theology proper, God himself. After I'd resigned the ministry in Maine, after a dozen years of doing the work of the Lord, and when I first got out to seminary for some more training, the very first lecture series, because what, what the Master Seminary uh, used to do, I don't know if they still do, in the spring they would always have a lecture series where they were addressing a particular theological issue. And when I arrived that year, they were addressing open theism and the puny view that open theism holds. You might wonder, why study this? Well, it's to worship him as God, not as some false ideology. We don't want a limited view of the glorious God. A high view of God is central to doing biblical ministry in this local church. It's in him that we live and move and exist, Acts 17.28. Now, Take your Bibles, run back to Jeremiah the prophet for a moment. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets. He's got a lot to say. We're just going to swoop down into chapter 10, Jeremiah 10. And it's intriguing what he does in verses 1 to 10 of Jeremiah 10. This is Jeremiah's satire on idolatry. Notice what he says, Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the peoples are delusion because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. Well, they decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. There's none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. Who would not fear you, O God of the nations? Indeed, it is your due, for among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like you. But they are altogether stupid and foolish. In their discipline of the delusion, their idol is wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. The work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith, violet and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord, notice this contrast, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. So think about Jeremiah's satire here. Man cuts his idol, works on it with his hand, he decorates it and makes it sturdy, and yet it is as impotent as a scarecrow. It can't speak, it needs to be carried. Now, When you first saw The Wizard of Oz, were you not mortified that this so-called great and powerful Oz was reduced to the man behind the curtain, who was neither powerful nor mighty as his voice was on the microphone? Jeremiah says, in regards to these idols that man fashions, it cannot harm, but it also can't help can't help your fears. Creators of them are stupid and foolish. And yet verse 9 says it's the best that the wise, skilled man can bring. And in contrast to all the foolish idols of the nations, God is the true, living, everlasting one, worthy of fear and all of our allegiance. 
Isaiah 46 is another satire on idolatry. Psalm 115, 1 to 7, all of this to show the foolishness of man's logic. False thinking, false views lead to false worship. Think about the Ten Commandments. The very first commandment is a prohibition of polytheism. When God delivered his law to Moses, and Moses said to the people, have no other gods before me. The second commandment expands it to no graven images, no idols. He requires to be worshipped in a proper manner and even extends to the third command to reverence when he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So with all the false religions of our day, the, the idols erected against the holy God, the one true God. There's the errors of polytheism with represented by Hinduism, Buddhism, and Mormonism. You've got pantheism for the transcendentalists. You've got idealism with Christian scientists and Plato and Hegel. Deism by some of our forefathers like Jefferson Voltaire and theistic evolutionists. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it's once more worthy of him and of her. In all her prayers and labors, this should have first place. Tozer said, we do the greatest service to the next generation of Christians by passing on to them undimmed and undiminished that noble concept of God which we receive from our Hebrew and Christian fathers of generations past. This will prove of greater value to them than anything that art or science can devise, unquote. So we are interested in... Madison, you want to get on that slide so I can click? Thank you, sir. Yep, it's not, uh, there we go. Knowledge of the holy, thank you. So with our loss of the sense of majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We need to begin to think of God more nearly as he is. 50 years ago, actually it's been more, uh, probably more like 60 years, A.W. Tozer heralded a warning in regards to a condition in the church that had existed and was getting worse. And it was that, quote, the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted it for one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking worshiping men. This she has done, not deliberately, but little by little and without her knowledge. And her very awareness only makes her situation all the more tragic. You see, brothers, the, the church at large has a low view of God. It has lost a sense of majesty. I probably should have uh, put that in, in bold font. We've lost a sense of majesty. We've lost our spirit of worship and the ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Those words from Scripture, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident, bustling worshiper in this first part of the 21st century. We need to begin to think of God more nearly as He is. And the only way to recoup our spiritual losses is to go back to the cause of them and make such corrections as the truth warrants. The decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way towards curing them. It's impossible to keep our idea of God erroneous or inadequate. We desire to bring back spiritual power to our lives in the church, we must begin to think of God more nearly as He is. 
You know, when I see such a, a meager understanding of God lived out in believers, I cringe. When I see such wrong perceptions of God postulated by such would-be Christian authors, I get to the point of infuriation. I, I, I long to light a fire under you to begin the practice of reverent meditation on the being of God. I think I think the spiritual discipline of meditation is a is lo- largely lost in the contemporary church. You. according to how he reveals himself in Scripture. We, we need to think rightly. Uh, to refer to Tozer again, he said, O Lord Almighty, not the God of the philosophers and the wise person, but the God of the prophets and apostles. They that know thee not may call upon thee as other than thou art, and so worship not thee, but a creature of their own fancy. Therefore, enlighten our minds that we may know thee as thou art so that we may perfectly love thee and worthily praise thee. This was a prayer that he put in that little paperback of his, The Knowledge of the Holy. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or wrong as the worshiper entertains either a high or a low view of God. J.I. Packer and knowing God, said the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father. For this reason, the the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. And I uh, I think our uh, computer is probably frozen, but uh, we'll continue on to the next slide if you've got your handouts. You might still wonder why. Why we need to think these biblical thoughts of God, why we must think rightly. Notice in your handout, first bullet point, Because no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Did you catch that? Because no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Without doubt, the mightiest thought that the mind can entertain is the thought of God. The thought of God. The weightiest word in any language is this word for God. It is crucial that our idea of God correspond as nearly as possible to the true being of God. It doesn't matter what we declare in Constitution or Creed and any of our doctrinal statements. Our real idea of God might lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions and might require an intelligent and vigorous search before it is finally unearthed and exposed for what it is. Only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about him. Third bullet point. A right conception of God is basically not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. This is not something to be ethereal and just thought about. It's meant to change our lives. We had mentioned last week when we introduced why we studied theology is the doxological, re- it leads us to greater heights of worship the more we dig down into biblical theology. So having a right conception. There's something improving to the mind in a contemplation of God. 
It's a subject so vast that our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. It not only humbles the mind, but it expands the mind as well. Nothing so enlarges the intellect nor magnifies our whole soul as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of God. We understand that at times it's going to pop the circuit breakers of our mind to contemplate the majesty of God. There can be no spiritual health, however, without doctrinal knowledge and clarity. It is to worship what the foundation is to the church building. And where it, wherever it's inadequate or out of plumb, that's a good phrase to use in our old church building, right? Out of plumb, the whole structure must sooner or later collapse. There's hardly an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot at some point be traced finally to an imperfect, ignoble thought about God. The Christian, not the world's conception of God these years, is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High God. According to J.I. Packer, he said the, the attitude we show the world is a sort of dried-up stoicism, miles removed from the joy unspeakable and full of glory which Peter took for granted that his readers would display in 1 Peter 1.8. And so... You might continue to, to probe. Here we go. Our obligation to God includes a lifelong duty to love God with every power of mind and soul to obey Him perfectly and to worship Him acceptably. A.W. Tozer said, when, when man's laboring conscience tells him that he has done none of these, but has from childhood been guilty of foul revolt against the majesty in the heavens, the inner pressure of self-accusation may become too heavy to bear. That's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel extols the greatness of God. Mere man could not have contrived that God, whose law was broken, sends himself to repair that breach. But low views of God destroy the gospel for all who hold them. A lot of professing Christians actually live like practical atheists, even idolaters. Idolatry is a sin that the heart is prone to, as the old French theologian Calvin said, that the heart is a factory of idols. That's why 1 John ends in the way it does. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Hardly a sin more hateful to God than the sin of idolatry. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than He is. It's, it's a monstrous sin, not a minor one. And it substitutes for the true God one made after His own likeness. You know, to the, to the wicked... In Psalm 50, you thought that I was altogether such a one as yourself. Surely this must be a serious affront to the most high God before whom cherubim and seraphim continually cry out, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, the Almighty God. Let us be aware of our pride lest we think that idolatry simply consists of kneeling before physical objects of adoration and that civilized people are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry, which we spent a couple of weeks digging into, is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. The Apostle Paul said when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. The degrading acts spoken of all began in the mind. It, it began with wrong ideas, which are the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow. 
you know, since I just mentioned Calvin, Calvin speaks to the connection of growth in big and biblical view of God having a sanctifying effect that as we see God's holiness, we get devastated by our own sinfulness. In the Institutes of Christian Religion, Calvin said this, he said, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom consists of two parts. Number one, the, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. In the first place, no one can look upon himself without immediately turning his thoughts to the contemplation of God in whom he lives and moves. And he quotes Acts 17 that uh, I I'd, uh, quoted earlier. Again, it's certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. Suppose we but once begin to raise our thoughts to God and to ponder his nature and how completely perfect are his righteous, righteousness and wisdom and power, the straight edge to which we must be shaped. Then what masquerading earlier as righteousness was pleasing in us will soon grow filthy in its consummate wickedness. What wonderfully impresses us under the name of wisdom will stink in its very foolishness. What wore the face of power will prove itself the most miserable weakness. That is, what in us seems perfection itself corresponds ill to the purity of God. That's why oftentimes when uh, discipling and counseling people trying to help develop a, a, a better fear of God and love for His holiness, I encourage them to, to study the attributes of God and even take a, a sheet front and back that goes through 31 names and attributes of God because as we have loftier thoughts of God's greatness and holiness, so we learn to hate our sin to a greater degree. So that gets into this next thought, the necessity of a proper or high view. So necessary is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standard declines along with it. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. Before a church is eclipsed, there just needs to be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. Simply giving a wrong answer to the question, what is God like? She may even continue to cling to a sound creed or statement of faith. Her practical working statement of faith becomes false, though. There's no shortage of sermons, no shortage of Christian books, teachings, all on how to pray, how to witness, how we can read our Bibles diligently, how to give, how to be happy Christians, how to be consecrated. You can have all this orthodoxy and hardly know God at all. The heaviest obligation lying on the Christian church is to purify and to elevate her concept of God until it's once more worthy of Him and of her. And all her prayers and services, this should take first place. We do the greatest service to our children and the next generation of believers by handing down to them an undiminished undimmed noble concept of God that we've received as he reveals himself in the Holy Scripture. Because as I've, if I've said it once, we've said it a thousand times around here, that right thinking leads to right worship. False thinking about God leads to false worship. Notice some of the references where this statement is pagans trust in false views and there's Jeremiah 10 that we read earlier. His satire on the false idols. Now let's, let's connect this to a study we did last year. We, we were studying the doctrine of the church last year. What is the church? The church is a community of worshipers and we're reminded every Lord's Day on the front cover of our bulletin that our gathering is about exalting God in our worship. 
God exalting worship. It's all about him, not about us. It's his story, not ours. So false thinking leads to false worship. True thinking about God leads to true worship. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, I guess I, we'd made a note there that uh, pagans trust in false views leading to their false worship. I'd submit to you as well that God's people have often been guilty of trusting false views. We could give you several references. I'll just give you one in your mind. It would be Exodus 32 as Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the law while God's people at the foot of the mountain are practicing idolatry. And when Aaron's fingers are caught in it, well, we just kind of threw the gold into the fire and out this popped. No, own up to your idolatry, O oh people of God. You want to know some of the effects of a knowledge of God? Those who know God, let's, let's, let's think through some of the practical aspects of the next few through next few slides. Those who know God have great energy for God. Great energy for God. Oops, I hit my button too quickly, didn't I? Um, if we were to spend a little time in Daniel, why would I be going to the Old Testament book of Daniel? In some of the narrative chapters of Daniel, we're told of the exploits of Daniel and three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were those who knew God. And in response, they felt compelled to stand out against the conventions and dictates of irreligious and false religion. They felt bound to openly challenge it. You know, Daniel 11.32, the people who know God shall be strong and do exploits. Should have put that in quotes so that you know that we're quoting Scripture. You know, they... They stand firm and they take action. Those who know him, they're, they're sensitive to situations in which God's truth and honor are being jeopardized. And rather than let the matter go without confront, they, they will confront it even at great personal risk because it's the glory of God at stake and there's nothing more important at stake when it's the glory of God at stake. You notice the reaction of the people of God to the anti-God trends that surround them. Before anything else, these are those who pray, and through that, their zeal and energy for God's glory come to expression. For instance, in, in Daniel 9, he sets himself to seek God by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and he Praise for the restoration of Jerusalem with, with uh, vehemence and passion and agony of spirit. Maybe the contemporary church would say, well, Daniel, you're a little too exuberant. And in the hush-hush of government overreach of our day, might even tell Daniel, you should have shut your window. Why, I'm going to carry on doing what I've always carried on in my worship of God. Knowledge of God adds fervor to prayer. Knowledge of God became energy for prayer as it is to us. That's the means of outlet as we channel that inner tension. We live by faith, not by fear, so that as we go to our knees in prayer, asking God to do that which we're incapable of, those things that are out of our control. Though you may not be in position to make public gestures against ungodliness and apostasy, you are in a position to pray. Because praying people have the privilege of seeing God stepping into the affairs of life. If little energy for prayer, it's a sign that we can scarcely know our God. 
By the way, if you want to add feet to your prayers, um, we've got plenty of schools around here that are trying to accommodate sexual sin. And uh, in the, the new bathrooms they're coming out with, and uh, that's why I pulled off from social media this, this week the email addresses and phone numbers that I need to activate uh, and add a little uh, feet to my, my prayer time. But uh, people that know God go to Him in prayer. They believe in the absolute sovereignty and power of God. What are some other effects of the knowledge of God? I would submit to you that those who know God also have great thoughts of God. And I guess my uh, this new rendition of the PowerPoint today that I tweaked didn't hold all of the uh, underlines and, and, bullet, and uh, bold faces, but uh, great thoughts of God. We cannot here unpack all that Daniel teaches us of the wisdom and might and truth of the great God who rules history and shows his sovereignty over nations and individuals for his own good pleasure. Well, let's stop and just think for a moment. We have said before that history, the unfolding of the events of history, is his story. His hand on every point in history, it's the unfolding of his eternal plan. It's his kingdom in the end that will triumph, not our own personal kingdoms. He knows and foreknows all so that he will have the last word in history and in the destiny of every man. Is this how we think of God? Is this view reflected in our praying? Or do we have a puny God that we pray to that is limited? Does this sense of his holy majesty, his moral perfection and his gracious faithfulness Keep us humble and dependent and awed and obedient as it did Daniel. That it would grow us in our prayer. It would draw us into our prayer closets as we beg God to do that which glorifies himself and is the good for his people. God indeed rules in the heavens. You see that all throughout the book of Daniel. It, you know, growth and grace is related to our knowledge of God. Second Peter 1, 2 and 3, I probably should have put the reference on this slide for us. Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Those who know God have great thoughts of God. Continuing the effects of knowing the God who reveals himself in his sacred word. Those who know God show great boldness for God. These are those who stuck their necks out. They counted the cost. They measured the risk. Oswald Chambers said they smilingly washed their hands of the consequences. In our lingo, our vernacular of our day, we say, let the chips fall where they may. We're going to obey God. Even if it means disobeying Caesar or any other number of man in our day. Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. They knew what the outcome would be if God didn't intervene. This was precisely the spirit of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the spirit of all who know God. Matter of fact, remember what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego confessed that our God is able to deliver, and if he doesn't, and then what they what was seen in the Hup fire of that day, the a fourth person. We need a larger view of God in the church of Jesus Christ because it has so many effects. Those who know God have great contentment in God. There's no peace like those whose minds are possessed with full assurance that they have known God. And God has known them. 
Being justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. And that we, we experience that peace which surpasses all human understanding, Philippians 4.7. Passes human intellect, passes human analysis, passes human insight. To say nothing of Romans 8. This is the peace that men of Daniel's day like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew. That's what caused them to stand their ground in the face of Nebuchadnezzar's ultimatum with the burning fiery furnace. Now, since we've uh, danced all around, uh, my Bible was still open to Jeremiah, so we don't have to go too far to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3. Verses 16 to 18. Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not deliver us out of your hand, hand, as they just said, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They're courteous. In other words, they're not in Caesar's face with their tongue sticking out and wagging their finger at Nebuchadnezzar. They're courteous, but unanswerable. They knew their God, live or die, they were content, just like Paul would be in his day. The comprehensiveness of our contentment is another measure whereby we may judge whether we know God. You know, God has everything to do with our existence, our purpose for existing and for the world. Uh, I've referred to Acts 17 a couple of times now. This will be the third. Acts 17, I think my notes say 28. It's in too small a font. In him we live and move and exist. Job 12, 9 to 10. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this and whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Hebrews 1, 2 and 3. Through whom, speaking of Christ, he made the ages, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Some of you know what a catechism is. A catechism is a where you memorize a question and an answer. It's, it's creedal. One of the best known catechisms is the Westminster Sort of Catechism. The first question of the Westminster Catechism is what is the chief end of man? What's man all about? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Why has God created me? What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. If the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him, how can we glorify a God that we do not know and definitely won't enjoy. Well, this is the study we are off into. Why don't we pray and then we will uh, go into our prayer time. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you that uh, we can dig into it so that you can reveal yourself and all your majestic splendor. Help us to have all of our views of you coming under submission to the scriptures and that you would correct any false views, any idolatry, that we might worship you as you are. We pray in your name and for your sake. Amen. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, 